Yay. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much uh, for joining us for our webinar today. I'm Jen Serling. I am the director of the Veterinary Technology Program and presenting and joining us today is the most amazing Tammy Smith, who is a credentialed veterinary technician and adjunct faculty for the program. And she has her veterinary technician specialist certification in dentistry. So she is like the most incredible person to talk all about dentals. So I will pass it to her. Okay, Mary Beth. So I'm just looking here and having a panic. Ah, there it is. So we're going to talk about dentistry a little bit today. And um, all right. So, right. We're going to talk about information to sink our teeth into. And I think um, on the fun side of things, you know, we think a lot in the veterinary profession about you know, what to tell our clients. But the truth is really, what should we do for our own pets? You know, what what should we be doing for our own pets? And it's really hard to convince our clients to do things if we don't do them ourselves, right? I have a hard time talking somebody into doing it. And for those of us who've been in the profession for a while, um, you know, we client education is something that just goes along and along and along and we change our focus as we go along as we learn more. So I wanted to start out and introduce Paris. She is my newest um, youngling or not so youngling. I adopted her in June um, from the rescue. She is supposedly eight and a half years old. And when I adopted her, the rescue said, oh my goodness, we had to do a major dental on her and we removed a whole bunch of teeth. So she licked my face and I just about fell over. So I told my husband, I said, we're probably gonna have to take out the rest of her teeth. And he said, but how do you know? Did you look in her mouth? And I said, no, cause she doesn't know she lives here yet and I'm not going to push her buttons but it doesn't smell like that if everything's okay. So I will tell you that she had nine remaining teeth. And if you notice her little tongue is hanging out the side of her mouth because she now has no remaining teeth. So she just brings up the question of, should she at eight and a half years really have no teeth, right? And she is tiny. It's hard to tell from this picture, but she weighs in at about seven pounds. Um, and and what do we, you know, as a as a pet owner, I guess I would like all of my pets to live forever. Um, and and kind of what do we do? How do, you know, why do we have to do things? Is dental care important? What is, you know, what is it, nece what is it necessary for? So I will say um, dentistry is is kind of moving into, or at least the goal from, from those of us on the dental nerd side of things, the goal is to move it into wellness, right? So we think about wellness as things that we just automatically do, right? We, we automatically do heartworm prevention. We automatically do vaccinations. And, and really dentistry for all the years that I've been in practice has been reactive, meaning we wait until it's horrific in there and we go in and we take out a whole bunch of teeth. And can't, isn't there a better way to do this? I mean, it, it you know, certainly there's pain involved with that when the when your teeth are rotting out of your face. Um, I will tell you honestly, Paris probably had the worst smelling breath that I've ever gotten into close contact with. Um, and I I don't want that for her. I will say one of my other dogs. Um, is now 13. I've had him since he was a puppy. Um, he weighs in closer to 15 pounds, so about double her size, but he's actually at 13 years of age, only had two incisors removed. So certainly that would be my goal, right? And it seems like a hard sell, but I will tell you for those of us who've been in practice for a while that at one point, um, heartworm prevention was a hard sell. So, you know, as we educate our clients, as we get better at things, we we bring them towards this, right? George has had a dental procedure pretty much every year of his life. Um, and, you know, the result is that he's a healthy older dog um, that's only had a few teeth removed. 
um, Paris is also healthy at this point. I will say her initial blood work when I adopted her showed some um, elevated liver values. And since she um, has had her dental procedure, uh, those values are now normal. So I can't promise that, you know, we're going to take out teeth and, and you know, we're going to cure every disease. But certainly the goal would be to have them, you know, live longer, ha healthier, happier lives. So, so, you know, when when should we do this? How should we do this? What, you know, is there an appropriate time. It does vary a little bit, right? As a tiny dog, Paris certainly would come to mind for me. You know, if I had had her as a puppy, um, I would not have let her get any older than two without a dental procedure. And, you know, and that is a full-on anesthetic event where we're going to clean teeth. Um, I have an 80 pound dog. Um, he was probably four before he had his first dental procedure. So, you know, I think that again, moving it into wellness means we don't wait until things, teeth are wiggling in there or, and we do have a tendency to base this on calculus. Oh, she doesn't need a dental procedure. She doesn't have any calculus. Um, the truth is the first sign of periodontal disease is actually ble bleeding when we probe, which we cannot do when we're awake, when they are awake, sorry, we could do it awake, I suppose. Um, so the first sign that really tells us they, they truly need an anesthetic event, let's say particularly in a larger breed dog, would be um, gingivitis. That's, that's really when we should start. And I would say, you know, as a, as a, you know, some of these teacup Yorkies and things that we see these days, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't, if, if the owner truly wants to retain their teeth, every six month dental procedures wouldn't be ridiculous to think of, but certainly, certainly every year. So for me, dentistry, dentistry is a preventative thing. I want to do it. Um, earlier and I want to do it often and I want to remove less teeth. You know, how do we talk to our clients about this? Well, those of you who are in practice know that when we are in the middle of a dental procedure and we call up a client and say, hey, we need to remove 13 teeth, they kind of freak out. So that is a way to present it. Hey, you know, we want to avoid having to remove all these dog, all your dog's teeth as they get older. We don't want them to be painful and it is a source of infection, right? And then the question becomes, well, can't we just do things at home? What about home care? Can't we prevent this with home care? So um, the this, this short answer to that is no, right? Um, as far as as far as things go, we all brush and floss our teeth twice a day and we all go twice a year and have our teeth cleaned. So so the short answer to that is no. You know, plaque builds up almost immediately after a cleaning within minutes. So, we, you know, home care is ideal um, to help stop the spread of the disease. But it's it's not the only thing. It's not the only thing that we can do. So. So how, how do we choose? If we're going to choose a home care product, how do we choose what to use, right? Temperament, um, you know, is is the gold standard for home care would be toothbrushing. Um, it, some dogs are not going to allow that. Um, you know, they're not they're not going to put up with that stage of disease. Right. Um, when I brought Paris home, would she have been a great candidate to start on dental chews? Right. I would have worried about her breaking her jaw. I'm not going to lie um, without in the absence of any dental radiographs, but right. She had pretty horrible periodontal disease. Um, I will say, you know, not every tooth in her mouth was horrid and, and got awful and had to go out. But I also, it, she had no other than upper canine. She had no remaining teeth on her upper. So she has nothing, you know, to occlude against, no teeth to chew against. And I, I opted with only nine teeth in there. I'm going to say five or six of the nine absolutely had to go. Um, why am I going to leave three teeth, right? She now laughs at George that she never has to have another dental procedure. So um, time, and, and by time, we're talking about how much time does the owner have to do these things? How much time do we have? Um, I travel quite a bit to for my work. So, you know, um, I, I'm not here every day to brush my dog's teeth. And I am realistic enough to recognize that my husband is, is not going to brush their teeth when I am not home. What about behavior? And by that, I mean, not so much, you know, temperament, but 
does the dog take the wonderful Oravet chew that is an amazing product and swallow it? Because that A means it's not doing anything and B is, is a risk for the dog, right? That the dog's going to choke on it or end up, you know, doing something of that nature, you know, acceptance, you know, Paris, Paris so far has, has not wanted to play with any toys. So trying to choose a chew toy for her, that's going to help with plaque, isn't going to work out ideally. Right. And there is the veterinary oral health council and they basically review products and determine, um, you know, do they do anything? They evaluate them based on, you know, tartar prevention and plaque prevention. So, um, I do look at products that way. And, you know, I tell clients, they'll say, well, my dog really likes this, this treat or that treat. It says it's good for teeth. If it doesn't have the VOHC seal of approval, it doesn't mean it doesn't do anything. It just means, you know, they haven't done the studies to prove that it does something. So um, this is the... I thought I put the VOHC website on here, but I guess I did not. It's VOHC.org. Um, you know, there's different categories of um, things that they evaluate, right? Toothpaste, and we said brushing is the gold standard, but I'm realistic enough to know that not every client is going to ho go home and brush their dog and or cat's teeth. Right. So we also have choose and diets. We have diets on there again. That's supposed to say uh, choose and toys. Um, and then there's some other products out there as well that are there's uh, wipes, there's water additives, there's um, kelp style products. And um, there's there's just a bunch of different things. I encourage you to go to VOHC.org and kind of look at the things that are available. Um there is a VOHC approved water additive, and for a lot of years there was not. Um, and I I really would not, you know, if that's all the client's going to do, if all they're going to do is put something in the dog or cat's water for them to drink, and it's not a VOHC approved product, I will take that as a benefit because every time that client adds that product to the water, you know, they're thinking about the dog or cat's teeth. So I, I will accept that as a benefit that at least the client is, is giving it those thoughts. So here's, that's where I put the VOHC website, right? And these are some products that I pulled off. Um, Healthy Mouth is the VOHC approved water additive. They make it in various flavors. There's tuna, there's like peanut butter. I mean, there's all sorts of things out there. Um, Pet Smile is a VOHC approved uh, toothpaste. Obviously, they have their little special brush there. Um, you know, flavored toothpaste maybe helps with acceptance. It also um, is something that can be swallowed, right? Because they're not going to rinse and spit. Um, and I put on there also um, this plaque off powder. And I will say I worked, uh, when I was working on my dental specialty, I worked at a pretty holistic practice. We did acupuncture, Chinese herbal therapy, and this type of product became available during that. And, you know, with that sort of clientele, they love the idea of it, of something like this that is, is fairly healthy. So these products are actually kelp. It's kelp that's in there, which also to me makes it um, acceptable for some kitties because it smells a little fishy. Um, and I did find one study on the human side that actually shows that this does help with um, some plaque and some gingivitis things. So um, it's kind of an interesting product that we wouldn't necessarily think or expect to be out there. Um, on the dog side, right, we have different cheat, uh, treats. This Maxi Guard that I put on here is actually not a VOHC approved product. However, you know, plaque removal is, is you know, it's soft and kind of gooey. So it's something fairly easy to do. So a uh, dentist friend of mine, you know, when he is traveling and teaching, his uh, family will not brush his dog's teeth either and but they will wipe them so you know using a wipe even if it's not necessarily vohc approved is going to help with some of that plaque removal the treats there in the green bag i put on there just as a kind of an aside they are vohc approved and that particular one that is what i have my husband give to my dogs when i'm out of town and it's actually available at Sam's Club. So it is, I swear when I saw the VOHC approval, I was sure it was pirated. And I had to get on um, 
and sure enough, they did they did do the thing. So it is Sam's Club brand and available at Sam's Club. So if you have those clients that are a little more concerned about cost, um, I think they're like 18 bucks a bag and I think there's 25 in there and they're actually scored in the middle that, so that you can break them. So if you had a smaller dog, the um, Tartar Shield is a VOHC approved product and that's kind of a poofy rawhide. So A, it is digestible and, you know, it's not that hard kind of leathery thing. So something, something else that's kind of out there. So I wanted to talk a little bit and kind of drift away a little bit from home care and kind of what we should do and just mention cats and some of their issues, right? So I saw something on Facebook recently. Um, a two, uh, someone was talking about a case, a two-year-old Maine Coon that, you know, oh, it had horrible. I love when people say it had severe stomatitis and just in my mind, stomatitis is severe. And that's kind of an oxymoron to say severe stomatitis. <laughs> but the kitty in the upper picture has juvenile gingivitis. So if you look at that picture, do you notice that the the inflammation, and yes, it's angry and it's really severe, but it's only in the gingiva. It's not in, excuse me. It is not moved above that mucogingival line onto the mucosa. The kitty in the bottom picture has stomatitis. When we see, see this really, really angry gingiva in young kitties, sometimes we can just clean them. So uh, one, of the, one of the doctors at my practice, you know, his kitty's name is Kevin. And he's like, Kevin has stomatitis. I think we're going to have to take out all his teeth. And I said, Kevin is very young. And I hadn't seen his mouth, but I'm like, you know, I don't know that this is where we are with him. So the case I was talking about on Facebook was a two-year-old Maine Coon that they had done full mouth extractions for severe stomatitis as as. Uh, the person had listed it. And my feeling was, oh my gosh, is it uh, was it actually juvenile gingivitis? Um, some of these juvenile kitties will get uh, kind of hyperplastic or gingival enlargement, um, like this kitty in the upper picture has. But in the bottom picture, you can truly see that that inflammation has spread beyond that mucogingival line into the mucosa. So just kind of something to be aware of and when we see these young cats, and this will usually start about the time their adult teeth are erupting. And I always, um, you know, would, if it was my kitty, I would be cleaning that cat every six months. And usually if it's just true juvenile onset, you know, juvenile gingivitis, um, about the age of two, they will actually kind of end up with normal mouths. So this is not something that we sign them up for every six months for years and years and years. Um, a lot of times these kitties will revert. So, you know, those of us on the technical side, we can kind of advocate for these kitties. And a product that I really like, I mean, yes, I would say professional cleanings, yes. Um, stomatitis kitties, different story, but for these juvenile gingivitis cats, there is also a juvenile periodontitis. What's the difference? The gingivitis is, is strictly kind of enlarged gingiva and um, that inflamed gingiva. So maybe a gingivectomy to treat the enlargement and cleaning to deal with that gingivitis. When they have juvenile periodontitis, they've actually lost some bone. So at that point, we may need to extract teeth um, on these younger kitties, but you know, the goal would be not to go right to um, full mouth extractions on these guys. Let's let's get them over. I can tell you that Kevin now has a very normal mouth at two and a half years of age. So that really, you know, would be our goal. So a product I do like for these types of cats. So this is, um, it's called 1TDC. It is an esterified fatty acid. Um, kitties tend to like this. Um and it, you know, it is kind of a tiny little capsule and you could, you, you see the little heart shaped thing there, you kind of twist it open and you could squeeze it on the food. But this is actually, they do have some um, really good studies on this that it really, really does help to reduce inflammation in the mouth. So for these kitties who have these types of things, I really love to uh, put them on this. Um, it has been shown to help a little bit with some um, mobility things and some joint types of things. But my my favorite case to use this is these these young kitties with some pretty severe uh, gingivitis going on. So 
not VOHC approved mainly because it doesn't fall in, you know, it doesn't remove plaque and it doesn't remove tartar or prevent buildup. So it doesn't really fall under the auspices of the VOHC. It's not the type of product that they would review. Um, but again, it's, it's kind of one of my favorites for this. So, um, if you've not been aware of this, kind of kind of look it up. The company's pretty good. They do have some samples and things, so you could uh, try it out on some of these guys. And if you're looking at if you're looking for this type of stuff, you will find it. So that's kind of quick. But any questions? I see there's a couple things in the chat. I just put a couple notes, Tammy, in there. Okay. So for participants, if you have any questions, if you click the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, that's a way to post a question. And I also put the link to the VOHC.org link that you mentioned in your talk. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so any questions, anything anybody wants to know? I know this was super fast, but... Um, a hundred percent, you know, I would put, I would put, um, you know, a professional cleaning, um, starting, starting them on products, you know, and again, whatever the owner will use, whatever the pet will accept and behave appropriately with, um, and kind of moving, moving ahead with that. And, you know, for me, it's just kind of a, just as a routine thing, I just, you know, I know, Hey, it's been about a year and it's time for George to have his dental cleaning. I also have a cavalier that um, has other issues, not heart as of yet, but um, oral issues. He has eosinophilic, eosinophilic granuloma complex. Um, so he gets routine cleanings um, and, you know, kind of let's work on moving this more towards preventative as opposed to reactive. You know, let's, let's prevent disease instead of um, waiting until it's horrible and taking out, you know, 20 teeth or something of that nature and work with our clients to talk about, Hey, we need, you know, we need this radiographic evaluation. We need this, um, anesthetic event to, uh, clean these teeth up and find out what's going on. So there's a, a couple questions. Um, the first question is what is your opinion on dental diets? Oh, I, you know what, that's was supposed to be on my list as well. Here's the thing with dental diets. Um, yes, they work, right? They're VOHC approved, which means they've done studies to prove that they work. The problem is that people have, well, I'll, I'll pick on TD a little bit, and I'm not anti-Hills by any stretch of the imagination. Um, TD is highly palatable because it has a bit of fat, right? And that makes it taste good. Um, it works very, very well. Um, but the, the tendency is, oh, I put my dog or my cat on TD and they're gaining weight. So I'll just give the TD as treats. It is not <clears throat> shown to be as effective as a treat alone. It really has to be fed as a diet if you're, if you're going to do it. So, um, you know, unfortunately, then we have to limit how much we're going to feed them if we're going to keep them from getting a little chubby. So... Um, next question is, does a professional dental cleaning always require anesthesia? And if so, what are the concerns about anesthetizing older animals? Yeah, good question. Yes, 100% it always requires anesthesia. And I am a Floridian, so we are a hotbed of anesthesia-free dentistry. And um, my first cavalier um, did have heart disease. Um I will tell you that typically how this is performed and they do market it to people like me who have, you know, a cavalier with heart disease and, oh my goodness, we can't anesthetize her. Um, I will tell you that they basically sit on them. So they kind of wrap them up in between their legs and kind of squeeze them down so that they can get in there and do this. So the, um, Black and tartar that is that is causing the periodontitis, right? The periodontitis is what eventually leads to bone loss and tooth loss. Um, the word the the visible portion of the teeth is not where the worst plaque and, and tartar is. Um, it is the subgingival plaque and tartar um, that really needs to be removed to do the best job, and they cannot do that awake. They will, a lot of these companies will tell people they are doing the same job that I would do under anesthesia, and I just call um, BS on that. So, um, 
you know, they can't take radiographs, they cannot probe. So basically all they are doing is cleaning the crowns. And I will tell, tell you historically, when these patients are eventually put under anesthesia for a dental procedure, they generally have large, large numbers of extractions. The other scary part about anesthesia-free dentistry is that our clients don't necessarily tell us they are doing this. And it is typically done by well, groomers and kind of adjunct, adjunct people in the veterinary field. Um, a lot of times our clients don't tell us. So if all we're looking at is the presence of tartar on the teeth, they will look pretty darn good. So in my mind, you know, I tell clients it's like a placebo. They think everything looks good and therefore it is good. And it by no means means that the dog does not have pain or um, any, any sort of issues going on. So yeah, a lot of our, you know, especially going forward, right? A lot of our dental cases do have comorbidities going on. They do have diabetes or kidney or, you know, renal or anything else. So pretty much um, we have to make those decisions kind of as we move forward. I will say that, that honestly, the idea that as we get older, anesthesia is less attractive to me is an argument for doing it earlier, right? Let's start them earlier. Let's prevent these things so that we're not, um, you know, we're not waiting until they really have a whole bunch of things going on. And then we have a longer anesthetic event. If these patients have been maintained, maybe with yearly cleanings and whatnot, then maybe as, maybe as they get older, we have a tooth that's causing a problem. Um, and not necessarily, you know, something where we're going to, we're going to have a, a two hour or three hour anesthetic event trying to deal with this. And yeah, I would say, you know, there, there came a time that I would not have been super interested in anesthetizing my cavalier for a dental procedure as her heart disease um, got worse. I will say um, she was at a five out of six murmur and pulmonary hypertension when she tried very hard to perforate her eye. And I have a good friend who's an ophthalmologist. And I was like, Rob, she perfs her eye. You're taking it out. And he was like, I don't want to. So I would have taken her to surgery in that instance, knowing that I could lose her during the procedure because she can't walk around with a hole in, hole in her eye. And um, I would I would make that decision rather than euthanizing her for that. But I think, you know, if we've done good preventative dentistry, hopefully we're not at that situation where we feel like we really need to anesthetize the cavalier in that <clears throat> kind of event. But as far as most of our, you know, mild renal um, liver issues, heart issues, you know, yeah, I I did my cavalier the last time when she was a four out of six murmur after consulting with a cardiologist about uh, protocols and did she feel it was, you know, a reasonable risk and whatnot. So sometimes we can go that route where we evaluate them. Um, but as you know, realistically, what I would love to see is that, you know, we don't end up with these 14 year old dogs with horrible rot mouths that now have, you know, diabetes and renal and all sorts of things, but we've worked towards preventing it. So hopefully that answered that question. And I'll, I'll chime in on that too. My favorite expression is, is age is not a disease. Well, there, there, there is, you know, comorbidities and, and, you know, I mean, as we get older, you know, obviously body systems change a little bit, but, but don't necessarily be afraid um, if, you know, your vet recommends, you know, that your dog needs a dental or your dog or your cat needs a dental procedure, talk to them, voice your concerns saying, you know, you know, I have, this is an 11, 12, whatever year old, you know, animal. And, and I'm worried about this. We do blood work before animals um, undergo anesthesia to make sure all those body systems are working properly. Um, make sure your vet is doing that um, so that we know that they're not, you know, possible higher anesthetic risk. And the other thing is, is ask your veterinarian who's going to be monitoring the anesthesia and doing the anesthesia and make sure it's a credential technician because we're trained to monitor and administer and and make sure we're anesthetists and 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 we will make sure that your pet um you know is taken care of the best way possible under anesthesia so so definitely talk to your vet talk to your credentialed vet tech because we can help um, kind of ease some of those worries 
it's definitely a conversation. And we know with, you know, anesthesia, there's never no risk, right? There's always some, some level of risk, but you know, to me, the risk of anesthesia, especially if we're doing it preventatively, is less than a, as we get older, having horrible disease and painful mouths and whatnot. So, other questions? That was a great one. I love talking about stuff like this. Tammy, your presentation was just fabulous. Oh, thank you. I was, you know, when we finished, I'm like, is this just way too short? But I, I try... I think for those of us in this field, you know, we all want our dogs and cats and various other creatures to live forever. And I think, you know, dentistry just plays into that. It, it really, you know, I I mean, my my cavi that finished her life is a six out of six murmur and, and with the pulmonary hypertension. I'm fairly sure you could feel her murmur on her little forehead. Um, finished life at 15 years of age, so... Um, another you question know. is, is, uh, the cost is shocking, which it is definitely not cheap. Um, yes. do you have any recommendations as to what might be a reasonable cost? Ooh, that's a really tough one. One thing I will say, um, and I meant to focus a little bit more on this earlier, but talking about dental care, starting it when our, when we do those puppy and kitten visits, you know, I don't know. I know on the first visit, we have about 10,000 things we cover. So maybe second visit or third visit, but it's a great time. First of all, you know, if I've just brought home a new puppy or kitten, we're developing all sorts of new habits in our household. It's a great time to start with toothbrushing. So um, that's, that's kind of a good focus there. And, and starting, starting this as a younger, I have totally lost track of the question, Jennifer, can you refresh my memory? <laughs> Uh, cost of cost of dental cost. So yeah. it definitely, <clears throat> definitely is inexpensive. If we're talking about this with younger pets, um, finding an insurance carrier that will cover that. Uh, some hospitals offer wellness plans that also include dentistry um, is a great way to go and make sure to take advantage of those benefits. And yeah, I think that it's something that we need to budget for. So I can't, I can't give you a, this is what it should cost or how much it should cost because it's going to vary um, quite a bit with demographics. I will tell you, my nephew has a young cat that fractured a canine and I was like, oh, that needs treatment. And, um, he, uh, I want to say the cat was one and a half at the time. He lives outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And for a one-year-old cat, and he basically called up and said, hey, you know, my aunt is a dental tech. And she said this this tooth either needs to be extracted or it needs a root canal. Um, and literally to just anesthetize this one and a half-year-old cat and remove one maxillary canine, the estimates he was getting were like $2,400 in that area. And I was like, for that price, you can fly here, have a vacation, and we can do it at my hospital. <laughs> um, and you can bring your wife. So um, I think that, you know, certainly there's a lot of variation in cost on this. And yeah, I think it's, you know, it's not cheap. Um, so it's something that as as pet owners, we should, like I said, if we haven't, um gotten an insurance policy or some sort of wellness plan that's going to cover that, then, you know, it's something we need to kind of put in our budget and maybe, you know, put aside X amount of dollars every month towards, towards a dental procedure or something of that nature. Cause it, it definitely is not inexpensive. So definitely look into to pet insurance too. Cause a lot of them now, some won't cover it. So read, read the fine print, sure you know, what you're getting. Yeah. Yeah. But some will cover, you know, a once a year routine dental, which can, as Tammy mentioned, can head off uh, issues. Um, I'm a huge proponent of, of pet insurance. Um, next question is, is if, if a cat has true stomatitis, is the end game always losing all the teeth? I would say a high percentage of the time, that's, that's really where we, where we end up. You know, these kitties are extremely resistant to home care because their mouth hurts badly. So, you know, brushing brushing would be ideal because they, you know, and unfortunately with stomatitis, they, they've done lots and lots of studies trying to determine what causes it and they're just not there with it. But they do feel it's, it's somewhere along the lines of like a very, very extreme reaction to plaque. So plaque prevention would be the key if we're trying to have a kitty um, retain some teeth. So, um, 
somewhere in the neighborhood of, I think, 77% of them just pretty much resolve with full mouth extractions. Um, there are some that will still have um, angry lesions after full mouth extractions. Um, I, I will tell you, honestly, if it was my kitty, I'd just take out all the teeth. Like I wouldn't even hesitate. This cat's going to, my, you know, that kitty would have a happier, healthier life with no teeth. Um, I know it sounds horrible and, and, you know, especially someone who's into dentistry and our, you know, our end goal is to save teeth. It sounds like a really extreme solution. Um, but the feeling of, and of any dentist friend that I have is that, you know, the longer we try to put off taking out the teeth, sometimes the less, um, effective it is when we finally get there. So, you know, back in the day we would see these kitties and we would give them a shot of Depo Medrol and kitty would, kid, kitty would feel great for, let's say six weeks or two months. And then the owner's back and we have to give them another shot. So now, you know, now as we've moved forward and, and do things better, um, we realize that yes, yeah, so over, over time, we have to give those injections closer and closer together because they respond less. And some, at some point we probably made them diabetic on top of all the other things. Um, but the dentists do feel that, you know, the more we do that and try and delay taking out their teeth, the less likely they are to respond when we get to doing it. Um, so really as, you know, as a, as a routine thing, like, um, and I can think of a two-year-old cat that was true stomatitis that we did have to remove all of its teeth. And I will tell you, honestly, um, I went to intubate this cat and I was like, I told my veterinarian, it was so proliferative in the back of the throat that I was like, are you sure this isn't squamous cell carcinoma? Um, and that catty, that kitty had an amazing recovery. Like the people are thrilled. He's back to normal life, playing, eating, you know, the normal happy cat that they brought home initially and not the miserable kitty that he ended up with those teeth. So um, there's just a comment. Um, routine. This is from Michigan. Um, routine prophylactic procedures for nine and 10 year old cats were $800 each. They did not have blood work done, however, and one cat had one extraction. So that gives you a little idea. That's, I would say that's probably on the really inexpensive end. And I, yeah, I mean, or middle, yeah, it's middle of the road. It might be, you might be able to, again, I wouldn't price shop it by any means. I would say if you're, you know, if you're looking at it, you definitely 100% um, don't want to go somewhere that is not doing dental x-rays because that's just a, a you know, to me, that's a sign that they're, they're not doing any kind of quality dentistry. So like, uh, um, I have another nephew that lives in Texas and he's like, you know, my kitty, I want to take him in for a dental procedure. How do I know where to go? And I literally was like, first question is, you know, do you do full mouth x-rays? And if they do not, then find somebody else. So, you know, that's a, that's a non-negotiable part of the procedure for it. And yeah, I think, you know, eight hundred, a thousand dollars. Unfortunately, is probably where we're gonna, you know, where we're gonna be. Um, this uh, person just this commented to, they had blood work evidently done prior to that, so okay. it would have. So that would've... price wasn't it? She was meaning the price wasn't including blood work, yes, not right. that it wasn't. Not that they didn't yeah. have blood work. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions? We could talk about teeth all day. I could. I don't know. Most, most of, most of my cohorts at, uh, Appalachian state run screaming from the building when dentistry comes up. So it's okay. That's why, that's why they have me. I do horse teeth. <laughs> and that's a whole different animal. It's very much so. Yes. Last chance for questions. Any last minute advice, Miss Tammy? Don't, I would say don't hesitate to, you know, get it done, get them evaluated. And, and, you know, definitely when we're talking costs of things um, 
and as and especially as you know as a as a credential veterinary technician who might be prevent presenting a treatment plan in the exam room um it doesn't get cheaper as they get older <laughs> so you know when they're looking at that cost for that you know three year old you're you're you know if you wait until they're 10 and we're taking out a bunch of teeth it got a lot lot more expensive you know preventative preventative is really the way to go so awesome well thank you so much happy to do it hopefully everybody learned something and got something out of it all right ladies thank you everybody for joining us today Yes, thank you so much. And I think a couple, Mary Beth, when is our next one?